Good morning. Good morning, lovely people of Facebook. A little bit croaky this morning. A little bit bedheady. Won't lie. Been out of bed about 12 minutes. Anyway, <laughs> welcome to my DIY y studio which is uh room 214 in the premiere in brixton today um and i'm coming at you live for the second in our series of half term hot topics this week we're interviewing parents who have experience of children with significant barriers to education or uh, accessing settings and their stories of working towards eotas um, and we're doing this because um we want people to see that it looks different for everybody um good morning suzanne good morning sam um so thank you for joining us if you would like to give this a share that would be amazing um we'll be together for about 40 minutes this morning just a quick intro in case you don't know who i am my name's heidi maver um i am a best-selling author apparently this is my book oh oh Oh, there we go. Your child is not broken. Parent your neurodivergent child without losing your marbles. It's a number one Amazon bestseller. Um, I've got news for you about the book soon. Um, but uh, that's my book. And um, I also founded EOTAS Matters, which is an organisation. Say organisation, it's me. Um, who support families and uh, parents and carers of children and young people who have barriers to attendance and who need to unlock support through the um through the ehcp system yes ruth that is ahead there there it is connected to my teenager he's asleep he will probably rouse at some point he's not wearing trousers so if that happens i will put my finger over my camera like this when he gets out of bed to put some trousers on but there's a very chan good chance that he'll just sleep we had a really late night last night we went to chinatown for dinner anyway I digress. My guest this morning is coming at us live from Suffolk um, and her name is Nikki. I'm going to bring her in and then we're going to have a chat about Nikki's experiences and her family's experiences. Um, and I'm really excited to talk about this because it's a nice alternative story to the one we had yesterday. So let's get her in. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. How are you? I'm good. Thank you. You? I'm good. Yeah, I'm good. I know we've had a little chat before. So like we're doing that thing where on TV where they pretend they've never met before, but we've we've had a little bit of a preamble. So um, thanks for joining us this morning. I'm really excited to talk to you because your story answers so many questions for people who basically come to me with, I think my kid's too young for EOTAS. You know, they've never really been in school. Do I have to prove that a setting doesn't work? How do I do that? Your story answers a lot of those questions it does. So, which is awesome so let's just dive in with a little bit of background you have three children I do um, yeah. and we're talking specifically about your middle child yes yeah. um who is called Dylan yeah yeah so tell us a little bit about um your where you got to how you got here let's just have a little bit of a conversation about what was going on for Dylan that meant that you realised that he needed something other than your older child had had, for example? So uh, my older child is um, home educated, but she goes to, um, a, well, they call it the Creative Education Centre. Um, she does that three days a week. Um, and she also does French class on a Thursday. And I always thought that Dylan would follow. So following the pandemic, um, Dylan's behaviour worsened. He almost seemed afraid to be outside. Um, I, as a parent, you shouldn't diagnose your own children, diagnosed him with um, post-pandemic anxiety, I think I wrote on the official forms. Mm -hmm. And my solution to that was to keep taking him, just keep taking him to groups. And eventually he would just be fine. A little bit of exposure therapy, a little bit of gate yeah. touching in your own way. Yeah, a little bit of gate yeah. touching. No one told me to do it. Um, I started the childminders that my daughter had thrived in. Um, and Dylan wouldn't go or he went I think he went twice and then he wouldn't go I did the whole let's just stay for a little while he'll get settled and then I'll leave I kept taking him to the French groups I kept I took him to home start I was desperate for this anxiety to leave him for him to react in the same way that my older child did yeah um he really didn't get on the first child minder so he had quite a lot of time off, about a year, where he was actually on her books, but he didn't go at all. So I came up with the parents' next solution, 
move child minded. Move him. Yeah. That could have solved all my problems. It didn't. I think he went twice to his next childminder. The first childminder was very outdoorsy, so I went for a very indoorsy childminder. Um, maybe it was that difference. That didn't work either. Um, and how old was he at this point? So he was about three and a half when I started with him at the childminders. Yeah. Um, and he was about four when I moved him. And what was that looking like for him? Like he was having difficulty being left. He was like dysregulated. What did that look like for him? He would um, scream basically if I tried to leave. I wrongly tried to leave one day when he was playing. I didn't say anything because if I could do that, then he would, you know, the next day he'd realize it was fine. Um, and it, at the end he was screaming, holding onto my leg. And then this, I want to call it a fabricated illness, but it's not a fabricated illness. He was, um, he'd start saying things the night before. Um, he was poorly, he was sick. That escalated to, um, I need to go to hospital, I need an ambulance. I tried to play out on this to see if he could give me more information. So I actually said to him, okay, I'm calling the ambulance now. And they're asking what's wrong with you. But he couldn't tell me. He would just repeat over and over again, I need an ambulance. Looking back at it, as I can now, I am pretty sure it was his way of saying to, to me, if I'm in hospital and I'm in hospital with you, I don't have to go to the child home. Yeah. So, yeah, yeah. Um, but I didn't think that at the time. Um, I'm not quite sure what I thought. I think, well, we were hitting crisis point. Um, we took him to a holiday club, which he wanted to go to. Him and my daughter both wanted to go. Um, I had a young baby, but that's fine. I can drop them off. Um, so I dropped them off. Sophia ran in um, off to find the activities. It's her idea of absolute heaven. And Dylan opened the door. He saw the activities. And it was the first time, but not the last time, he turned and bolted. And I still had a young baby and we were chasing him towards the road. And just as a lorry came, um, Dylan went to step out. And that's when we got him. Had we have been a second behind, we'd be having a different conversation today. Um, and that's when I thought, I really, really need help. Um, so I went back in, I'll admit a bit sobby, shaky, not quite know what to do, um, gripping by then, my two youngest children because I couldn't let either of them go um and I asked the lady that ran it who's a friend of mine I said I need some help um I don't know what to do I've tried taking him out um I've tried you know staying with him I've tried it's not working um and she introduced me to another parent of two of the children um at Holiday Club who's still involved in our life today actually she's our our psychotherapist and she had room because I've been trying to get play therapy for weeks but everyone had said we're full we're full we're full and um, she had room and she started working with our family um, and I was watching him there and I thought he's got ADHD now neurodivergence itself isn't new to me I um, did some studies so I've worked in placements in schools I've worked with adults with um, severe mental health difficulties. I've come across autism, but not the way my child displays it. So I said, I'm sure he's got ADHD. And she said, I think he's got PDA. She said, I can't diagnose, um, but if I had to have a guess, I'd say PDA. So I said, what's that? PDA? <laughs> is that just that public displays of affection? <laughs> what's that about? <laughs> yeah. Exactly. Um, but, uh, um, so being me, I came home and I lived on Google for the next 24 hours, Googling everything you could know about PDA, good, bad, indifferent, probably some of it completely inaccurate because that's Google. Mm -hmm. um, but the psychotherapist had given us um, a link for Nest, um, who were doing some online webinars. So we thought, I can't even remember what it was, but it wasn't a lot. Okay, let's have a listen to these people then. 
so we did one night we put the kids to bed and called up the laptop and we decided to listen to this webinar together and there they described more or less word for word my child my child didn't have anxiety because of the pandemic and now looking back I can see that I can look back to his toddlerhood and go oh but a Joe Jingles even at two he used to run back to me a lot I'd sort of not really realized that at the time but now I'm starting to put those things together mm. um, and in the end we went down to Nest um, and they organized a diagnosis for us um, so we went down to Surrey for the day, which is quite a long way from Suffolk, but it was completely worth it. Um, and there was a Pizza Express right near there as well, which, you know, makes the day more tolerable. So we went down, um, we had our two and a half hours or whatever it is. So uh, predictably, uh, my son wouldn't go in the room with um, with their staff, you know, he... So my husband and me had to split up because I had to go and do a long, long interview about our history. Um, and my husband went into the room with Dylan um, so that he could take part in his bit. And then you have, I think in, on the schedule, it was like half an hour or an hour where you can go outside if you want for a wander around or you can go in a separate room um, and they go off and they discuss your diagnosis and they try and agree. Yeah. Ours was two minutes and they came back and they all unanimously had gone into the room and said he's definitely got PDA PDA mm -hmm. so that was really interesting and for us that was a bit of a turning point because I had a diagnosis I didn't have any paper I couldn't prove it to anyone I had a diagnosis and Dylan had gone to his assessment dressed as a Dalmatian at that point Dylan went lots of places dressed as a Dalmatian and all morning I'd said to him do you think you need to get changed look I've got some some clothes here like you're seeing a paediatrician I think you need to get changed no I'm going as Dalmatian and I've never confessed this to Nest um but they congratulated me during the assessment they said oh we've never had anyone that's let their child come as a Dalmatian before I think it's fantastic you are letting him be himself I had asked him time to get dressed I'd lost the battle so I've never quite admitted that. I just thought that the, the you're like, oh, thank you. I try to be very child led. <laughs> Open brackets. I was so worried about what you might think of my child dress Dalmatian. But that was such a turning point for me because it was like, actually, doesn't matter if my child's a Dalmatian. He's now not a Dalmatian. He's a creeper at the moment from Minecraft. We've moved on. Um, but actually, that was the first time I started to really be like, actually, I'm more obsessed than all these professionals are so why don't why do I feel that need to control so much that yeah. he must turn up in in jeans and t-shirts there was nothing given to me that said your child must wear I you know that had come from me and I think that was a real turning point for us where I was then able to become more low demand yeah I was able to think does it matter but obviously with that came their recommendations that if we ever wanted to not home educate um, and obviously my son was having a very diff different experience because he was at home full time unlike my daughter which wasn't what I planned um, they'd recommend the OTAS what's the OTAS um, which is how I came to find your page because I went back to my googling thing what is the OTAS and could it be better for him and better for us as a family mm -hmm. um, and that's how we came to start asking for an EOTAS package so Dylan hasn't actually been to school I don't think I don't think he ever would uh, walk in the door you know if I had a school I can't say what he'll be like in 10 years time of course I can't but at the minute he would never have managed even day one let alone anything yeah. else I think that the most recent stats are something like 70 percent of PDA kids aren't in school that's the one that so I've been. It's, you know, if you've got a child who's PDA, there's a very good chance that school is not going to be the right fit for them. Yeah. Um, at which brings a whole bunch of stuff with it. So how old was he when you applied for your EHCP and secured your EHCP? And I'm aware there'll be a gap. 
Uh, so he was five um, and it was secured before he was six. So they both came um, at age five. Um, so technically he was home educated the start of his reception journey. Um, I didn't have the evidence. I don't think I knew what EOTAS was, let alone the fact that I could apply for it. Um, when I applied for an EHCP, I handed my notice in. So I made it very clear to the council that Dylan was no longer home educated and I wished them to take responsibility. However, at that point, I did highlight that he had um, complex needs and that I would only allow him to be going somewhere suitable. Yeah, really. So, so vital because I know I've had conversations with families who have quite young children and the pushback they're getting is they're too young. They have to try school. Um, you won't get EOTAS for a kid that's, you know, three or four or five. Um, and, you know, if you're home educating, you won't be able to shift to EOTAS. But your experience disproves all of that. Yes. Yeah. So yeah. We, he has never been on a school roll. He's never tried to go into a school. He's never lo even looked around a school. Um it's not a suitable place for him at this time. Um, anyone that has EOTAS will know that it's reviewed annually anyway. So we're only talking about the current year at the moment and then we'll have another review. Yeah. Um, but it was agreed without, um, he did have to see um, an educational psychologist, um, but they came to our house to yeah. see him. And the other thing that I think is really important that your story illustrates is that there is a difference between elective home education and EOTAS. Completely. And so, because you've got home educated kids and you've got a kid yeah. in EOTAS. So do you mind just really unpicking the differences for us, for, you, for your children? Of course. So the main difference comes with um, the responsibility. Whose responsibility is it? So my daughter, uh, my eldest, my youngest is still too young to be of compulsory school age. So, um, we won't count her, but my eldest daughter, it's my responsibility to make sure that she gets an all rounded education. I choose to um, send her to this education centre because I like it. I'm not selling it as that's the only way you can home ed. But because that's my choice, that is also my res financial responsibility. Dylan has an alternative provision. He does um, six hours a week over two days. Um, that is the council's financial responsibility. So the council pay my alternative provision for Dylan direct, um, and they also provide things like um, his therapy. Um, he he goes, I take him swimming. So that's the big difference. If I go swimming, I take both the children, but one's, you know, the council's responsibility. I can be asked to provide a report for my daughter it wouldn't be the same for my son. Yeah, yeah. So it's whose responsibility is it? Yeah. Um, and obviously with Dylan, we would quite happily have paid for an alternative provision for him. But unfortunately, the ones that are suitable, he could have like an hour a week for Sophia's three days. Yeah. So that's why we had to go down this route because yeah. he does need that more intensive support. Yeah. So I think that's, that's key as well because some people have, EHE with a personal budget yeah but actually in the case of EOTA specifically it's tied to an EHCP and it's to address the special educational needs that that child or young person has so the funded activity that you have meets his needs as a child with additional yeah. needs yeah yes. um amazing and so, and I'm also wondering like because I, I loved that you shared with me that you had been self-funding for some activity and you asked them for the money back right how did that work yeah. out so I handed my notice in to um, the council, um, it was July, when I asked for my EHCP now, or my EHC needs assessment. Now, um, the law states that after 15 days of a child being out of a setting, the council should fund, fund some alternative provision that meets their needs. Um, it won't surprise you to know that my council didn't. So because of the summer holidays, my council should have started funding something for Dylan um, in September, but nothing came. So I chased it and nothing came. I chased it a few more times, but I won't bore you with the details. At uh, this time, it was getting a lot for me. Um, I was dealing with his 
challenging behaviour as well. And I was sort of hitting crisis points. So, I mean, I'll be honest, I rang them up sobbing, going, you're going to have to do something. Nothing came. Um, I asked for a freedom of information request to see how many other children this was affecting and was surprised to find that no children in Suffolk were without this 15 day education when their parents um, had requested it. There was one child who um, was referred to um, ATS, which is their in-house provision. I believe it was 36 days after they should have done, which was really weird. So I rang up ATS and I said, oh, I don't know whether this is my child on that particular. I said, you know, have you heard of this child? Like, you know, gave them all the details. Oh, yeah, we couldn't meet his need. We declined him. But no one had told me. And wow. I think the day that they had flicked over an email, they were like, done, let's put him under ATS because it will look good on the Freedom of Information request. So I kept my spreadsheet. I went through stage one, stage two complaints um, and was basically told there was nothing that they could do. Could go to LGO. It has gone to LGO, actually, um, because I want compensation for it. But that's another story. Um, so I decided in my wisdom, being that I was struggling with my child's behaviour, to send an email to the um, chief executive and then came the copies in. Well, they're obvious, uh, the first ones. So, you know, the people, your know, case handler. Um, and then I went a bit further, Ofsted. Ofsted can't do anything, but they will register your complaint. So they will know that that has happened when they're um you know when they go do their inspection mm -hmm. to do the inspection um i can't leave it at that can i parent user forum the send scrutiny committee you can get send scrutiny committee minutes online you can then find all their email addresses they normally include counselors they include whoever add them anyone you can i think my mp I got to about 37 email addresses and I sent it off. Um, the question was quite clear. Um, what was I meant to do with him tomorrow as they didn't want him to have a temporary um, education? Are they confirming I shouldn't have spent out for a term in providing him an education? Um, and is this the case for all children in Suffolk? Can all children in Suffolk miss education? Or was it just mine because he had complex needs and was therefore disabled? 72 hours later, I can confirm that I got my EHIP and I also got a payment for when they should have taken responsibility for my child's education, which was September. Just chef's kiss. Like, <laughs> just, well, yeah. I have you and Eleanor to thank for that because actually, um, a lot of my complaints process I actually got off your webinar. Um, yeah, the art of complaining webinar. Um, once I get my bee in my bonnet, which I certainly had that day, I was very, very angry. Um, and yeah. I think important to recognise that not all parents have the capacity or the spoons to do that. Yeah. And we're not suggesting you put yourself through that if that is not something that is a work for your family. And I really want to encourage families to formalize their complaint complaints and their process if they are able even if you're not able to get a complaint in make sure you're logging everything so that when you do have capacity you will be able to do that because like you say like i'm a big fan of the of the, of the carbon copy box on emails like i am like right which world and his wife can i copy into this email yeah. to show the person that people are looking to see what they're going to do with this response um, yeah, I think that and I also good. always add at the bottom of my emails, for clarity, please, I request that you do a reply all to this email <laughs> so that they can't just reply to me and like slide it under the radar. So, yeah, I, I love that. I love that. Um, da -da 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 -da. Kaylee is asking, what we'll do, Kaylee, is we'll we'll address this in the group. I don't know if you're in our group, but Kaylee's saying, could you send me a message of some email addresses? Suffolk are ignoring my stage two complaint, which was escalated in November. Perhaps uh, if you've got spoons later, Nikki, we could draw up a list and pop it in the group. Would that yeah, be acceptable? Definitely. Brilliant. Yeah. Okay. Um, 
All right, so uh, Samantha says, um, and I'm guessing from her name that she's a home editor. <laughs> Nikki, you could be describing my son. Eventually, in year one, I took him out of school because he'd been screaming every day. Polly, stomachache, feeling sick, legs hurt. He's now 11, and I've always been told he couldn't have any HCP due to being home ed. Since finding Heidi's page, I'm just starting the HCP process, but finding it extremely difficult due to not having any school backup. I think that's, I mean, you've got what there, Samantha, you've got six years of home ed. You've got some good, you've got some good evidence there. It's just about making that evidence work for you, um, I think would be what I'd say. I there. Also, um, have a look at who you've got because you'd be surprised who you have got. So um, I'm friends with this lady that runs this holiday club. Well, she's a pastor and I asked her to write a witness statement and mm -hmm. I sent that to the council. I said, can you write down? So if you go to any home ed groups or anything like that, you've got anyone, ask them to write you a statement to show that, that you know, there are difficulties there. And if you go on to our EOTAS, I think it's part of the EOTAS 101 webinar, there are some downloads for templates that you can use for gathering evidence from your providers and from other parties. So what was what's worked for you as a family? I'm wondering, like, what have been your... What's made the difference to Dylan? I've had to learn um, how to deal with his difficulties. So once when I had to have control, I mean, our trip to London is classic. So we went to London. Dylan's on a buggy board. My youngest is in the pushchair. Um, we see the monument because we've been talking about the fire of London. So I pick Dylan up off the buggy board because he's got to join in, right? Because he's never going to and he melts down and it turns to absolute disaster and actually it's my husband that stepped in and he said why are you doing that because the webinar we'd watched from next said don't do that I said but he's not joining in I brought them all the way to and I, I'll admit to having a bit of a moment myself I brought them all the way to London I spent all this money and he's not joining in so anyway he goes back on the buggy board and I have a bit of a strop um <laughs> And later, I realised, actually, I can't remember what he pointed out, but he's taken everything in from that buggy board. He's in his safe place. And we stopped for lunch and he said, oh, but this has been a brilliant trip. And I was like, but you've only sat on the buggy board. And it was something in me that had to say, actually, does it matter? Does the fact he's on a buggy board or the fact that he can't sit still mean he's not paying attention? No. So I'd say the biggest thing for me was learning low demand parenting because mm -hmm. Sophia is very, very confident. She'll be in your face and wanting to take part in everything, but he might be stood back, but mm -hmm. I've had to learn that that's okay. Mm -hmm. Right. Uh, and we went to a holiday club yesterday, which I was really nervous about because it was the first time since we had the issue that I described earlier. And he loved the first hour and a half. And then we sat in another room building Lego bricks. Now, yeah. that would really have bothered me because I'd be like, no, come on, you've got to go back in. You've got to do this. You've got to do that. You know, all the children are. Whereas now I'm just like, that's cool. We've enjoyed an hour and a half. Let's play Lego. So yeah. me and him in another room um, playing Lego. And that was abs that's absolutely fine. So I think managing my expectations, he's very intelligent. But because he won't sit and look at me, I always assumed he wasn't being involved. He yeah. is being involved in his own way. He yeah. will run around. He will spin. That's how he regulates himself. Try not to let that. I think that was my first one. Um, having the, the EOTAS package has been fabulous because he's got an alternative provision involved. Um, they do take him out. They haven't yet been able to take him to their group where there's four children, or at least they did once, but he then refused to go again. But that's fine. They're back to working at home. That's been brilliant because it gives me a break. Mm -hmm. And I think that's a big one. Us parents don't like to admit it. We're all like, oh, no, we're the most. But actually, if you can plan a break for yourself, that's really good. On Tuesday, I don't have any of my children. My youngest is now at the Childminder. Um, my eldest, the Education Centre. And Dylan has his alternative provision, which means I have a whole morning to do what I want to do. And I Bliss. think that's really good for you. You yeah. know, I'm much more patient if I've had that break. I can be, because he will constantly talk at me, very, very loud. Um, 
it really helps I think to have that break but just and feeling listened to I think helps yeah you know if you've got someone that you can but I think that comes with time because to start off with people would say things to me like oh he's a boy yeah that's why he's different because he's a boy and that almost invalidates you if that makes sense um, I, I cannot, anyone that throws anything at me around neurodivergence that begins with an assumption that yes. presentation is based on gender drives me mental. Yes. Um, it's, it's, a, it's lazy, it's misogynistic, sexist, patriarchal rubbish. And I can say that as someone who has a child, a person in my life who presented as female for a long time and then presented as male. Um, and he, they didn't change but the way that people perceive them changed. Yeah. So it's not about them and their gender, it's about the way we read people and their gender presentation. So yeah. we do know that children who are socialized as girls are far less likely to be diagnosed autistic. And that's because we expect different things from children who are socialized as girls than things who are children who are socialized as boys. But it's not because they're boys or girls, it's because yeah. of the expectation it drives me mad. And, and also the idea that that would be that would make it okay it's because he's a boy you know we we, yeah. we we expect boys to struggle with things we expect boys to be difficult we expect boys to be challenging in their behavior how unfair is that on boys you know yeah, it's like oh he's bouncing around because he's a boy but actually yeah. i know and i've i've learned and had it clarified that actually that is his way of regulating himself yeah so if he does something stressful if he could then bounce on the trampoline for half an hour he'll come back because yeah. that's him. Yeah. Nothing to do with his gender. <laughs> no. No. I the other thing that I think is really important to raise to mention about your story is that he doesn't have full time provision, right? He doesn't, no. Because I think that's also a thing where people are like, Oh, I need to fill like twenty five hours a week with yeah. the OTAS. The really important thing to be aware of is that legislation says that it should be full-time provision or provision suitable to their special educational needs. So Dylan wouldn't currently Dylan wouldn't, it wouldn't be appropriate for him to have 25 yeah. hours. What does it look so how did you decide what to ask for, what to include, what was going to work for you? What well, did that look like? What I originally included is not actually what I've got. Um I've got as I went across the journey, I actually think I've ended up with something better and more mm. suitable for him. So I originally asked for two days with a company called Lapwing and one day for a school was my original request. Um, and then as we carried on, so I've already mentioned he'd started seeing the psychotherapist. We wished for that to continue as well because um, he's made huge leaps and bounds since he's been working with her. Um, as the journey went on, Lapwing, who I believe are brilliant, were actually full, so I'd have to wait for several terms. Um, however, our psychotherapist actually found um, a company called F Push Forward, and they are fabulous because I don't trust anyone. So I, before um, they got named, I actually went, rang them up and said, can I come and see you? And they were like, absolutely, come have a chat. I like people like that. Always Especially a good time. A SEN child that has had difficulties you want to protect them don't you as a parent so who yeah. are these people um and they're fabulous so um they understood immediately that um dropping dylan off with them is not an option it might be in the future and it's what we strive for and it's what we hope for but it's not an option so they started coming to the house and i thought i've got to amuse an adult and a child for two hours what am i going to do Day one, they turn up with a bag full of stuff. They've done all sorts. They've made cakes. They've made sausage rolls. They've done science experiments, always bringing stuff with them. And then they start to invite him out. Would you like to go to an out park? It's only, you know, would you like to go here? Would you like to go to soft play? Would you like to go? Um, and he might only go for an hour or so. Um, but like they say, they get used to the car. They get used to um, all of that sort of thing. So then he did go to their site. So there's four children and four adults at their, at their primary site. Um, but it, he had a fabulous day, but it was a bit much for him. The anxiety hit the next day. Oh, dear. I thought we've got this childminder situation again. So I text uh, the woman who runs the primary, who is one of his one-to-ones, and I said, 
he's been having panic attacks all night. Oh, no worries. We'll just start again. So they turn up with the games and they start playing at home. Sure enough, he then goes out with them. And hopefully one day he will go to their site. So he has that two days a week. So um, it was three hours. But before half term, he said uh, they, they went to soft play and he said it wasn't long enough. And so they've invited him to try four hours after half term. We started at two hours. So we're slowly, slowly building up to the day. Um, but they're so flexible. And that's what I really like about them. Um, he has his uh, psychotherapist that he's been working with for over a year now. He has an hour with her. Now, because she's not a provision, that's included in a personal budget. So I get a personal budget half termly. <clears throat> Hopefully, I haven't received my remittance advice yet, but we'll, that's another story. Um, you know I, who to copy in if that doesn't happen. <clears throat> um, I'll get it eventually. I just possibly not by the date it's meant to be paid. Um, so he has an hour with her a week. He has an hour with Mind Jam. Yeah. For anyone that doesn't know Mind Jam, it's um, like mentoring, but um, through online games. So for Dylan, that is Minecraft. That is the most important thing in his world. And I just tend to hear shrieks of delight. He absolutely loves it. He's quite animated. We have to have a bit of chill, quiet downtime afterwards, but is the absolute highlight of his week. So um, I wouldn't want that to change. Um, and then in addition to that, there is a home um, education gym session or what is it, home and family or something um, at our local gym, which is really unstructured because Dylan can't cope with structured. Um, it's like, here's the equipment. As long as you're being safe, do what you like with it. Go, you know, if you want to spend the whole hour on a trampoline, then that's fine. Fill your so boots. <laughs> yeah, he absolutely loves that. And they pay his swimming membership for me and him. Again, lessons would be inappropriate for Dylan. Um, it would take him months to build up the relationship to be able to have it. So they pay for me and him to go swimming. And we do that once a week. So that is his um his week at the moment i love that um when you were talking about the provider who it went a bit too far for him and that they just went back to the beginning i yeah. freaking love that and like when you're talking about you know he's getting used to going in the car he's getting used to these things all without trauma though that's the key yeah. right so yeah he's, he's, he's building yeah, he's building confidence and trust in these people around him and these significant adults and knowing he's going to be safe in these environments, but without distress. And yeah. that's the difference. Because if he's not distressed, his brain will let him know that that is and can be safe. If he's distressed, his brain is telling him completely opposite to what's going on. So I love that, that they just go, yeah, we'll start doing the sausage rolls, no problem. And they've got five adults um, that work in the setting but they've identified two at the moment because they say that five is just too many to get him so he has one on a tuesday and one on a thursday and the hope is over time they'll you know when he's happy to go to the site and what i like is it is when he is happy not yes when we decide when yes. he is happy to go to the site regularly they will start trying to encourage him to work with the other adults Yes. They didn't want one key person because they said if that person's then off, he's got no provision. So they do two. Um, but, you know, all those things they've thought about him and his difficulties with getting to know people. Rather all about than... relationships with, with, yeah. with PTA kids. Always. Always. Um, and this is what we this is what people miss who don't understand PDA. Yeah. It doesn't matter what the activity is. It's about the person you're doing it with. Um and it can driven. Yeah. I think that's what people miss. It's not being difficult driven, it's anxiety driven. Yeah. Yeah. That that is his, you know, although it might not appear like that when he's throwing some himself on the floor and saying, I can't walk, and I actually that what whatever's under it is he's trying to run away from that anxiety that real anxiety. Yeah. Like Helen says, trust and connection is vital, isn't yeah. it? Yes. Yeah. Okay key i'm gonna um do a little bit of signposting in a minute but before we wrap up because people are asking a couple of questions and i know where i'm going to tell them to go and find that information 
what are you hoping for then? What does it look like for you and your family going forward? Like, because it looks very different to what it would have looked like if you'd continued yes. down the child minding, potentially school route, right? Or homeschool yes. as you were doing it, whatever. What are you hoping for? I'm hoping that this increase in confidence that I've seen over the last year continues. I would say that I had a very unhappy child um, a couple of years ago. That is not the case. I have a good relationship with him. We can have fun as a family. And I'm hoping that that continues. I'd like to, I'd like to take him abroad, um, which is something that I probably would have said, absolutely no way. It's not happening. No. Um, mm -hmm. And I just like to have really good adventures with him and, you know, as a family and make loads of memories. Um, so when I'm old, I can look back and say, didn't we have an excellent childhood? Yeah. That's and what does he want? Like, is he like got things that he has on his list that he wants to tick off? Not really. So we, he started with, he desperately wants to go to the Creative Education Centre. That was like his goal. Um, and he had to go. And when he couldn't go, when he was five, he was like, well, I have to go when I'm six. Mm -hmm. um, but I think that's gone down now. Um, he's he doesn't feel like he's missing out probably because he's got so much else to do um, but no I wouldn't say he's quite at the age and aptitude where he can really sort of make a plan go because they always when they ask the children's views um, ask a, a send child in crisis Dylan's answer was um, I can't see for mushrooms so <laughs> That actually is. Oh, it's not though. Because they, they ask us all the time, what does your child want to do? What does your child want to do when they, you know, and you're like, I don't know. They're just trying to survive. Like, yeah. don't ask us that question. Like, let's get them to a place where they can trust people and be okay in the world. And then yeah. we'll ask that question. You know, and like, and I was always that child that like, I still don't know what I want to do when I grow up. I always wait to write a book. I've done that now. Now what do I do? Do you know what I mean? Like, you write another one, I do well that's also on the cards but we'll talk about that another time so what do you want to because i'm going to do a little bit of signposting in it but let's leave parents with a little bit of as someone who's been there and who's had a slight well a different experience to other people and this is what's key is like everyone's experience of your task is different what do you want to tell people listening that you wish you had known at the beginning what 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 would have been helpful to you and what do you think could be helpful to other parents stop trying to make your child conform i think would be my biggest one don't be have all this pressure of society expects um society expects my child to get off the buggy board even though it leads to complete distress i'd say that's my biggest one um and don't be put off when the professionals say no mm -hmm. so if they say no there's no um educational mm -hmm. psychologist as i was told we can't get it done in the time scale if you put in the relevant complaint a psychologist called me and said, oh, I've got some spare time next week. Funny that. But there were none. So, yeah, if the, if the professionals say no, you don't have to take that as no. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I think that's really, really key. Um, so a couple of people are asking for things. Just humour me for a minute and I'll just do a little yeah. bit of signposting. Um, Sue's saying, so pleased to hear that things are working out for you and Dylan. Thank you. And Ruth is saying, Joe always says, I'm only 13. I don't know what all the things are yet. Right? <laughs> um, <clears throat> so people are asking about the 12 days thing. If you go to my website, HeidiMaver.com, go to the top, there's a section for parents. And there's a free resources part. And there's a video that talks you through the 12 day, the, the 15 days thing. I just say 12. So what you're entitled to when your child has missed 15 days of school, how to raise it, how to log it as a formal complaint. And there's a template link as well. So that's the first thing. The second thing is people are asking about how do you know what to put in your EOTAS package? Again, go to the website, parents section, webinars. There's a webinar on putting together an EOTAS package, which will help you and has templates and helps you helps you work out what you could and couldn't ask for and what you should and shouldn't be expecting and all of that kind of jazz. You know, it's not the only place you can get information, but hey ho, I work for myself and this is me pimping myself. So Thanks so much for joining us this morning, Nikki. It's been so amazing to have someone because it was it's so important that we that we unpick some of these myths that are being said. And one of the biggest things that is said, if you're home educating, you can't get a Yotas and you are living proof that that is just not true. So not true. 
I'm so pleased that things are going so well for you and Dylan and um, really, really pleased. So I'll end the broadcast, but stay in the green room and we'll say our goodbyes. But for everyone joining, thank you very much this morning. I'm back tomorrow morning with the third in our series, the final one. And I'll be telling you about something I've got for you on Friday. Um, but tomorrow I am joined by, cannot remember. Oh, God, I'm useless. I've already got three people's names to remember. Anyway, another parent. Oh, my God. I'm so sorry, whoever it is. I'm really sorry. But I'm joined tomorrow by, by another parent at 10 o'clock um, for another EOTAS success stories. He's awake, isn't he? He's awake. Are you awake? Oh, no, he's not. Okay, right. So we'll see you all tomorrow. Uh, thanks for joining me, Nikki. Thanks again. Thank you.